Something that I say along the way will touch you. I know it. Let's begin that process of crafting a meaningful life. Here's Mary Crafts. Welcome, welcome back to Crafting a Meaningful Life. I'm Mary Crafts, and that's what we do here every week, is craft a meaningful life. Usually, uh, I have a guest on with me because I don't know everything in life. I know it's hard to believe, but I don't know everything in life. And I love the opportunity to bring on people who have so much wisdom in a certain area. But every once in a while, I'm drawn to give the podcast by myself again, because this is a time when it's just you and me. And I get to talk to you about crafting a meaningful life. Very few people ask me the question, why should I craft a meaningful life? That's kind of a given. I think that we know that that's part of what we do here, is we try and understand the why and then take it to movement and action. And it's pretty obvious in everything that we do why we want to do this, why we want to craft a meaningful life, as I say almost every single week, so that we don't get to the end and say, oh, is that all there was to this life? Or, oh, regret, I wish I would have. Or you see those kind of quotation and memes all the time that say, nobody ever gets to the end of their life and says, oh, I wish I'd spent more time with my business and made more money. So we we get it. We get that we're supposed to, and we want to craft this meaningful life. But how? Some ask the question, when should I be doing this? And I try and get all shoulds out of my life. I don't want to should all over my life. It's that I can and I want to. So the answer to when is simply now. Now. But the answer to how is much deeper and much more complicated on. I decided early on that the how of my life in crafting a meaningful life began with one very critical principle. And that was the principle of integrity. I wanted to be a woman of integrity. As I was doing my company, I wanted to be a woman and a business owner that people could trust. Early on when I used to do all the events myself, I would make them and serve them and clean them up and the whole nine yards in my catering business. I was working in the early years for a company called Geneva Steel here in Utah County. And John, um, or Joe Cannon had just been put in as the new CEO. And I would oftentimes cater their board meetings. I would show up within the morning with the pastries and all of those kinds of things and the juices and the coffee and the waters and set it all up. And then I would stay and refresh it for their break and then rechange it out for lunch. So I got to sit in on those board meetings all day. And there's one very particular board meeting that I remember that really focused and gave me clarity on how I wanted to craft my meaningful life. And we were sitting in a board meeting and it was a little bit contentious. I'm off to the side back by the buffet, but it was very kind of contentious. And one gentleman stood up and they were debating whether or not they were going to keep Joe as their CEO. And the gentleman said, I want to tell you something about Joe so that you know the kind of man that leads this company. He went on to say, I was Joe's accountant in Washington, D.C. when Joe lived and worked there. And if you can imagine, all of my clients would come to me and say, like, can I get away with this? Or how can we hide this on my taxes? And what what would be the maximum amount so the IRS wouldn't like question my return? And he goes, I got those questions every single day. Joe would come to me and say the exact opposite. 
I want to be as far away from that edge as I can. Keep me always in integrity on my taxes. Please call me on the carpet if you see that I'm doing something that's out of alignment with integrity. Keep me as close to the mountain as I can. He never wanted the tires of his life to be close to that edge and always wondering if he would fall off. And then he sat down. At that moment, in the young years of my company, I thought, that's, that's what I want to be. That's how I want to craft my life. So that there's not a question of my integrity. That people can come to trust me. That's how I ran my company the entire 35 years that I was there. And it was never a question of whether I was going to pay my taxes or be honest There were tons of opportunities to pad the bill a little bit for people as they did catering with me, but I never wanted to go there. I always stayed as close to the mountain as I could. In fact, I even received an award from the university, uh, Utah Valley University, for my integrity. It was called the Ethics Award, and it meant so much to me at the time. It wasn't until I retired at age 65 that I began to look at other pieces of my life that were out of integrity. Other pieces of my life where I had not been trustworthy. Other pieces of my life that needed to come into alignment. And I want to share some of those with you that you might begin to craft your life a little earlier. That's what I'm only reason I'm doing these things is that maybe a little earlier in your life, you can take a look because it is a matter of integrity and honesty and what I call now nakedness. I was living a life of hiding, hiding the truth about me and who I was. On the books, at work, that was the easy part of living in integrity. (laughs) That didn't even now hold a glimmer to what real integrity and being trustworthy means. For me, there was emotional honesty. Crafting a meaningful life for me meant I had to be emotionally honest with myself and with others. And it started with me. I had to peel back the layers of all those things throughout my life that I had been wanting to hide, hide from myself so I didn't have to look at them, hide from others so they didn't see or dislike me, for some of the things that I thought were so ugly inside of me. I struggled with forever with a sense of belonging. I struggled forever with a sense of being enough. I used to blame my mom a lot for this. I didn't ever understand why in my entire growing up years, she never complimented me one time on anything, my homework, my singing voice, my appearance, how I played the piano, nothing. One time I had a photographer getting my senior pictures and I always thought of myself as so ugly. And he said to me, I want you to not smile this time and just keep your mouth closed and turn slightly because I want to be able to show those beautiful lips that you have. So natural. What? I I have beautiful lips? No one ever told me. I never saw. I couldn't wait to get back to the card, bend the mirror down, and take a look and say, do I have beautiful lips? And I looked at them. I was like, maybe, maybe. Maybe they look very proportioned. Maybe they're natural. And so as I drove home, I wanted to tell my mom 
because I thought my mom didn't ever see any of those pieces of me. And so when I walked in, we were kind of just sitting at the kitchen table and I nonchalantly said, the photographer, I think, took some pretty good pictures today. He actually liked my lips. He said, I had very pretty lips. And to we do some with my mouth closed rather than smiling. And I guess I wanted my mom to say, they are very pretty. But in keeping with my mom's true self and who she was, turned to me and said, that's not for anyone to say to you. Being, that's a gift if God, if you do have beautiful lips. The glory always must go to God, never to you. And that was my mom's way of raising humble Christian children was to make sure they never were complimented and only realized that anything that we had came from God. I raised my children a little differently, but yet my children grew up with a sense that they weren't enough as well. How is that? How is that in this advanced year, you know, in the in the, in 2023, 20, 24, that we are still having children that are born and raised feeling not enough. If I could have given my children one gift, it would have been that one. But somehow I failed. And the reason I did was because I still was carrying all those things of not being enough. I fight with it every day of not belonging, of not having a place. So I'm pulling back the curtain so that you don't just think, oh, there's Mary Crafts. She must, she is so smart. She's, she must know it all because I don't. I still, every day, work on that piece of honesty within me, pulling back the curtain, allowing my naked self to be seen my spiritual honesty with allowing what I feel spiritually to be seen and not hidden, mental honesty about my thought processes and how I come to them, physical honesty about parts of my body. I, I still struggle, even after losing half of my body weight and becoming so physically fit, I still struggle with that. Yeah. <laughs> and you'd think I'd be able to say, hey, this body's 70 years old. It's a good enough, okay? Most days I am. But some days I'm not. And to be able to show that honesty to people, social honesty is another one of those things where we have to be on, on Facebook and Instagram and LinkedIn and everything else and only show the best of us. I think I've told you this before that people say to me all the time, Mary, you're so photogenic. <laughs> I laugh and say to them, ha, that's because I only post the good ones. I mean, we take a, hundreds of pictures where we look awful. We don't post those. We post the good ones. I don't come here in the morning, uh, be here in front of you with uh, my pajamas and my hair all messed up and no makeup. I take time to make myself presentable, what I consider presentable, and the way I like to be to the world. But it's socially honest to be able to say, I don't wake up in the morning looking like this. And sometimes I show that. I show myself with my face clean scrubbed, ready to roll, without a wig, all those things, because I think that's the way that we become honest with ourselves is by being honest like that with others. The most important phrase that I have ever uttered on this podcast or that I ever wrote in my book is this. The healing starts when the hiding stops. You want to begin to heal? You must stop hiding. Are you ready?
What things are you currently hiding that you don't want others to know? Your spouse, your children, your neighbors, your friends, people on social media. What are you hiding? I can tell you the things that I am hiding still. Sometimes I hide what I eat, even now, because it was for so many years, 50 years of my life, I spent hiding every bite I put in my mouth. And now I find myself doing it out of habit. And I have to stop and just say, okay, you're here by yourself. Uh, why are you hiding that wrapper in the bottom of the waste can? That doesn't even make sense, right? What is it that I hide from John, from my children? Those are the things that you can work on now to find that spot of healing. Whatever that is that you're currently hiding, that you don't want others to see. What is that? Is it a scar you carry here? That's physical hiding. Is it a mental and emotional wound you're carrying here or here? And you don't want others to see that. I don't know how to drill this in to this podcast more than to say, if you want to heal, the hiding must stop. And whatever pieces you keep hiding will never heal. I know that at deep levels. And that's why every single day I'm working on it. I'm working at showing a little bit more and a little bit more. Now I think and do many things to craft my meaningful life. I didn't always, I didn't have time. It was just survival for me for so long. But I realized that that survival was not good for me or for my family. And so start where you are. You don't have to wait until you're 70 or retired or anything else. You get to start where you are right now. And that's one of the beautiful things. You don't have to start in this big, grandiose way. You can start in small ways. One of the things that really has helped me craft my life is my morning meditation. And it has evolved to something completely different now than I started with. I used to think, I don't have time for that. Mm -mm. I, I, I would take away from whatever time I had with my children or whatever time that I needed at work and keep me uh, occupied away from uh, my children. I didn't. But then when I realized that by spending time with myself every single day. I could decide when it was. Morning is best, but I could do it at lunchtime. I could do it in the evening after everyone was in bed. But spending time with me became critically important. Now that my children have grown, I'm retired. It's easier. I will tell you that. But no less important to do it no matter how old you are or what your situation is. I have people tell me all the time, I don't have time to do that in my life, Mary. And I say, you don't have five minutes because literally that's all I'm saying. I'm not saying, you know, a moment, an hour in deep meditation. I'm saying five minutes. You don't have five minutes to fill your cup so that you can fill the cups of others. Really? Think about that. That's a pretty self-centered way to live that we don't have five minutes for ourselves and every bit of our life has to be given away. That sounds like the Puritan thought process of my mom. Okay, so my morning meditation is simply to start breathing. And it's October now, late October, and I'm still going outside to feel the sun and walk in the grass. 
Now I wait till it's about 11 when the grass is warmer. <laughs> but even in the middle of winter, you can go out in your boots and just spend a few moments walking on the earth and allowing the earth to energize you. And I do lots of movements and I do lots of stretching down to the earth, touching the earth, reaching to the sun, the sky, pushing away negative things inside of me and drawing them in. And then I sit down for just a few minutes of meditation. I start by making the sign of infinity. When I first started this, I used to say this, I release the things of my past and embrace the things of my future. And then I moved to, I embrace the things in my past and embrace the things in my future, knowing that they were all part of me. And I needed to embrace them all. I wanted to embrace them all. Lately, I've been reaching beyond my physical life here into my lives before me and eternity then, and into my lives beyond here, into those reaches of infinity. And so I say, I embrace all of you. And I point out far and bring it in. And I look to the future beyond this life. I embrace all of you to here. And then in that circle of infinity, I began to see my place and where I am right now which is here at the intersection of infinity and focus on the now of what I can bring today. I ask for the messages that there are for me rather than my spending my time asking for everything. I ask, what are your messages for me? And then I just close my eyes and listen. There are always messages. One of them is always gratitude. So much gratitude for where I am. But then I'm oftentimes given other messages. As I think through the now of today, what do I do today? What am I bringing to the world today? It's a beautiful place to live in the now. Not worrying about the past, not fretting about the future, but just now. It's part, the biggest part of my crafting, a meaningful life every single day. It's not about doing this perfectly. I've kind of given up that. Because I've always said, Perfectionism will kill you, but seeking for your best self will inspire me every day of my life. I don't see this meditation as a checklist thing. Okay, I got that done for the day. I can move on. I love this so much. I'm drawn to it. I want to bring it in my life. But if someday I miss a day or I don't bring it into my life or it doesn't include every piece of this, it's okay. I did my best for the day. And tomorrow, there's another day. I just do what I desire. And I desire this inspiration in my life every single day. I used to say in my younger years, the way to craft your meaningful life was to discover your passions, what you were passionate about. And so I discovered that one of the things I was passionate about was music. And I got a music minor. One of the things I was passionate about was helping others. And I graduated with a degree in social work. And then when I moved on from that to my career of 35 years, I discovered I had such a passion for creating beautiful food and delicious food and creating the art of breaking bread with people 
and allow them to experience the love and joy of that. I had a passion for marketing what and getting people to really want this kind of dining in their life. I had a passion for cooking and creating and all those kind of things. And that passion drove me through so much of my life. I also knew that in the middle years of my life, that one of the things that really motivated me every day as I crafted my life was thinking about having a legacy. And what was I leaving behind? And what were my children gifting? And what was I giving to them? But as I aged, and I began to realize that it was less about seeking the things I was passionate about, and more about seeking my purpose, about what was my purpose in this life, and really focus in on clarity. I wanted clarity about my vision and purpose here. And once I received that, then things that brought more of that into me, I was like a magnet for. They were drawn to me and I was drawn to them. It was like a magnet discovering purpose and clarity. Sometimes my purpose and clarity <laughs> is overwhelming. I just have to say it is. Uh, there's, there's so much in this life that I want to touch and I want to heal and I want to help. Sometimes I have to regroup. Last week was one of them. For example, I was asked to tend my grandchildren, the family that has four of them, and the parents were gone on a couple's retreat to Colorado. And I was so delighted to come. I just love these grandchildren. I love them all. These four are, there's, they have a lot going on between all their activities. They have to be at school. We leave for school at seven in the morning because we drive. It's a camp, it's a commute. And we have to have breakfast done and their lunch is made and everyone's at the table having breakfast. They're such good helpers. We gather the chicken eggs, we feed the dogs, we all those things, and out the door by 7 o'clock. That's a lot, but I love it. It's It shows purpose for me. I am really clear about how being with my grandchildren is so much a part of my vision and mission. And then go back, pick them up at 3.15, well, sometimes 12.15, sometimes 2.15, sometimes 4.15, but... A couple days a week, it's 3.15. <laughs> and I try and get all the rest of my life in the middle of that and then spend the evenings with them and start over again. I was able to do that for six days. But on Monday morning, after they left for school, I had my podcast to record. And it was a bit of a heavy podcast. But I want, it was a podcast I wanted to give. On Tuesday, I went to a t local TV station and was on their morning talk show speaking on domestic violence because this is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And I loved being there and speaking about that. The things I've learned how to survive after domestic violence and to thrive and to really use that as part of your stepping stones in life and I loved saying that it really had less to do about being a victim recovery of the perpetrator and way more to do with being a recovery victim of my own thought processes. I loved sharing that. Then it was the children again. And then the next morning was a symposium for Supriya, which is an organization that I support. And the whole day we sat immersed in in stories and understanding of childhood sexual abuse and the effects it has on our society. Every single sex trafficking survival I've ever talked to was a victim first of childhood sexual abuse. Every single woman I've ever talked to in the state prison was a victim 
of childhood sexual abuse. Every single person is by affected by this in our lives, whether we were personally a victim or our spouse was a victim or we knew somebody or our mother was or whoever it was, one in five people around us were affected by them. And I wanted to be there that whole day and soak in all the things that can be done. Went home with the children, got them to school. On Thursday morning, I was a speaker and received an award at the sex trafficking conference at Weber State University. And as I sat there and listened to the stories, the autobiographies, of actual survivors, of the police work that's being done, of how we can begin to stop this in our lives. I was filled with being empowered with what purpose and clarity. Then got home, picked the children up. The next day, get them to school. Now it's Friday. And I began to realize the heaviness I was feeling. Self-awareness is key in crafting a meaningful life. Because if you're not aware, you just allow it to continue to come down on you sometimes, and it's overwhelming. There is so much happening in the world right now. War is in two places in our, in our world, in our, and It's like I can hardly watch the news, and yet I want to stand up for them. I want to stand up for Ukraine. I want to stand up for Israel. And yet when I watch the news, I'm so weighted down. By the time I left on Friday, I was in depression. And I had to say to John, John, this is where I am. I'm in overwhelm. I'm trying to craft my meaningful life, but it's been so heavy I can hardly breathe. We went to the jazz game that night. It gave me a chance to laugh and clap, and I love the jazz. They're our local uh, national NBA team. And But by the getting close to the end of the game, I realized again this heaviness upon me. And it wasn't a matter of just going to a jazz game to lift my, lift my spirits. So yesterday morning, as I woke, I began to think about processing these emotions and the way that I was crafting my life and making sure that I had enough energy and I had filled enough of my cup that I could continue to bring about my mission and my vision. So I went into meditation a second time that day. Yeah. (laughs) I went into meditation just to ask, what were the messages and what am I to learn? It was a great meditation and afterwards... I knew I wanted to go in and just soak in a warm bath. Not a bubble bath kind of thing where you're listening to crazy music, but I just soaked in such a warm bath. And I was listening to Celtic meditation music and not trying to reach or understand anything, but I was trying to release. And when I stepped out of the water, I consciously thought about leaving all of this stress there, opening the drain and let it flow away, down the drain and away from me. It's a beautiful process. It's part of how I craft my life and I don't get overwhelmed with the heaviness. This morning when I was in meditation again, I did my meditation, I I went in to get dressed to come on this podcast And a thought came to my my mind, like 
Because remember, I always ask, what are my messages? And sometimes they don't all come at that moment. Sometimes they come later. I was in putting on my makeup and getting ready. And the thought came to me, go back into your bedroom. It's time for you to know who you are. I thought that a curious thing. There was that push to almost ignore it because, hey, I've got my podcast coming up. i got to remove, re- review my notes. I want to see what I'm doing before I go on today. But I, I didn't ignore it. I went back in. On my nightstand, I keep a deck of cards. It's called Oracle Cards. And sometimes I'm prompted to, to draw a card that, that I personally draw after I have felt into the cards and find one. And this morning, there wasn't any question which card was for me. And I pulled it out. I had never seen this card before. I didn't even know what it meant. What's Mintankin? Mintankin, I've never even heard that word. And yet I've owned this deck of cards for five, six years. Hmm. Hmm. Let's see if I can find out what this is about. So I looked it up on the internet, Mintankan, and there were lots of meanings, but all of them had to relate that they were um, a series of planet solar system that no longer existed, that had been part of the Orion system. And as I looked and read further and further on the internet about this, they talked about These people have come here with one mission, to bring light and unity and oneness. Do you know how many times I've been told that oneness is my vision and purpose? It's what I'm to be about, bringing about oneness on the planet, whether it's in my own family or whether it's with the world. It's why I'm going to Kenya this week because there's some peace that I'm going to do over there and serve. But as I began to read through it, that these people of this lineage were committed to a life of light and love and healing. If that didn't describe me, I didn't know what was. And it was time for me to know that this is not just something I dreamed up but it's something that's in my DNA that is my mission and how I am crafting my meaningful life. And that wouldn't you like to know what is your personal mission, personal purpose and clarity on what it means to craft your meaningful life. I have so many people say to me after I've finished speaking or after I've done a podcast or whatever, and they come up to me and they say this, when I grow up, I want to be just like you. And while I appreciate that, and I appreciate the sentiment, I want them to understand and you to understand something vitally important, that whatever good you see in me, whatever light you see in me, you only see it because it lives in you. If you didn't have it as a part of your cellular DNA or um, purpose, you wouldn't see it in me. And that's the great thing about when you see good in other people. Now, the reverse is also true. When we see evil in other people or when we see, you know, jealousy or whatever it is we see in other people, we only see that because it also resides in us. So, but both sides help us. If we see something or put off by someone, we can go, wow, that's a mirror for me. I see that in me. If we see good in other people, you can claim that goodness in you. And I think that that is one of the most beautiful things in this entire world, when we know that that beauty resides in us. I've always struggled with belonging. Never felt like I belonged anywhere. It's one of the 
great gifts that I have with John is I, I do finally feel like I belong somewhere. I've never even felt like I belonged with my family, that there was always that I thought my family was just like my mom, just critical of me, and that I was never enough for any of them. Those are my, some of my youngest memories of not belonging. But also some of my youngest memories are <clears throat> of spiritual things. I remember when I was three, there was something that happened that I just thought, I feel this inside of me. Is this my spirit? I remember when I was seven, I watched a movie on TV on Saturday afternoon matinee. So you know it was one of those B movies. But it moved me to believe that I was a spiritual person and that I had special gifts for this planet. Would you like to know what your special gifts are? It takes time. It takes time. It's not just going to bestow upon you like a gift from heaven. You'll want to seek it. You want to seek how you're to craft your meaningful life. One of the best ways to do this is to spend time with yourself. Yeah, and ask. Ask yourself. Ask God. Ask your guides. All your angel guides and God and, and even yourself was, were programmed down to your DNA to help you find and to guide you to this very thing, your purpose, your clarity, your vision, your meaningful life. It was all, has all come together for this, for you. And so I want you to be joyful. I want you to be happy. Now my life has this much self-doubt and not belonging, not being enough. And it has this much of clarity and purpose and vision and belonging of being more than enough for whatever is placed in front of me. This award that I received this week from um, the sex trafficking conference for the work that I've done there is a laser cut piece of iron with a cutout of Joan of Arc and then below it it says Mary Crafts woman warrior as I looked at it I saw that cutout that laser cut Joan of Arc and I thought I know her most favorite and I know her most famous saying, I'm not afraid. I was born for this. Be not afraid. You were born for this. Whatever you're struggling through is actually your path to clarity and purpose. You were born for this, as was I. We are the same. I see you. You see me, and we are one. And that's the greatest gift that we can give as we craft our meaningful life. Namaste. Crafting a Meaningful Life.